you have to figure out a way to have people do it and they have to create these environments where they can speak up with each other, against each other. They can have this creative friction. They can have a marketplace of ideas where they argue back and forth about what the best idea is. But how do you do that when they've never even met or know who they are? Welcome to The Thinking Leader, brought to you by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives, military experts, and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world. Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Hello and welcome to another episode, and I am super excited today. I'm catching up with my good friend, Bryce Hoffman, and we have a guest, Bryce, who's joining us. We do, Marcus. Dr. Dan Dworkis is joining us today. He's an ER doctor at USC, but he is also the chief medical officer of Mission Critical Team Institute, which is a think tank that focuses on building successful mission critical teams, which is something that is near and dear to us. He's also the author of The Emergency Mind. Dr. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I, I'm a, a huge fan. One of these like, you know, long time listener, first time caller moments. So I'm, I'm happy to be here with you. all. <laughs> well, we're happy to have you. So, you know, you and I connected on, on LinkedIn and mm -hmm. we have a common interest in how people make decisions, both in general, but also in particular under pressure. Talk to Absolutely. me about, about, uh, about your thoughts on that and your work. Yeah, I think that's, um, I am endlessly, endlessly fascinated by that, right? I think that's the thing like you wake up thinking about, you think about in the shower, you know, how are you doing this differently and how are you doing this better? And I think you, there's actually like a very subtle but important thing that you said in that first, that very first sentence, which is that the way that we make decisions in normal life is not really the way that we make decisions under pressure. And I, and hopefully part of what I'm here to talk with you all about today is to add even a third category to that, which is emergency. And it's really yes. like, just right off the bat, I would say like emergencies are not just worse, bad situations. They're actually qualitatively different than bad situations. And I think that there's a lot to dig into for that because the systems that we use either in normal life or even in high pressure life aren't necessarily going to be the same systems that we want to bring to bear in like a true crisis and emergency. Um, those things are rare, but they're wildly different than just normal bad scenarios. So this is what so I spend true. a lot of my time thinking about. Yeah. So, so true because they, they often require us to break the rules of normal life. You know, I, I think it, an example that I always, I always share in this regard is uh, several years ago, my wife and I were in Istanbul and we were, I, I, there's a, cool restaurant I love on the Asian side of the Bosporus. And we were staying in the, in the European side and taking the ferry across. And I had it perfectly time for watching sunset over the, over the, over the old city and stuff. And in the middle of the Bosporus Straits, suddenly our ferry just starts going into really increasingly sharp uh, circles mm. and starts listing heavily. And, you know, I could tell there was something wrong. What struck me was almost no one else was even reacting and it was getting progressively worse. And I realized that we were on the side that if, if we, if we went over was going to be on the bottom. And so I just grabbed my wife's hand and there was a galley door open in front of us. We were out on the deck. I walked in and the, and the guy in the galley tried to say, you know, like no, no, no passengers in here. And I just pushed past him. The, the water was, they had pots of boiling water Oof. for chai on the, on the uh, stove. They were all tipping over and spilling on the floor because the ship was listing that badly. And I got over to the other side. I had my wife grab one of the, you know, handrails, uh, going up to the, to the upper deck. And I grabbed another one and I said, when this goes over, you know, this will pull us up and we'll be on, on the top. And I'm like, this is the way we need to mm -hmm. swim and stuff like this. And there's like a Russian oil tanker bearing down on us with the horns blaring and stuff. So we couldn't get to move. <laughs> and still most people were looking at us like we were crazy. Mm. And like, what are these crazy Americans doing? You know, like grabbing the side of the boat like that. And unfortunately they, <laughs> they, they, they got it right. It, just, it turned out the rudder was stuck and the engine throttle oh. was stuck at the same time. So, um, but my point is, is it was a real 
a real example for me of normalcy bias in action, which is that most people mm -hmm. are more worried about not like, you know, disobeying a crew order or something, you know, to not go into the galley than they are about a ship listing over and finding themselves under 10 feet of water and not able to, to get out. And I think that's just an example of how people, people's brains just are not wired often to think about how to react in situations like that. So how are you training your mission critical crews down to deal with them? Because that scenario that Bryce talks about clearly in emergency settings must have happened quite a lot. So how are you training your mission critical teams and the people within it to not go into that paralysis that we often see and when normalcy bias kicks in, how do they override that and go into response mode without being reactive, if that makes sense? Absolutely. There's, there's so many uh, interesting and important parts of that story. I love the detail that it was two failures happening at once, right? Like yes. a rudder and a throttle, right? Because that's what a lot of these things are, right? One failure, we often have systems that are resilient to it or robust mm -hmm. to it is probably the better word to it. And we are used to things writing themselves because that's what happens for most of us most of the time. But then you get into these universes where two things hit at once and you're mm -hmm. like, okay, well, this is now behaving in a way that is unlike what I'm used to doing. But I'm sure that wasn't your first time on a boat right? Like, yeah. and I'm yeah. sure that wasn't your first time even seeing a boat that had a small failure on it. You probably just didn't notice all the other times because it never triggered some thresholds like this, right? And so now you're in this universe that's behaving differently than, than you're expecting it. And one of the first things that you did in that story that's so critical is saying to yourself, okay, I'm in a different universe than I thought I was now, right? And I think that's part of it. But, but Marcus answered part of your question, like when I first started this, right, I first started this whole line of thought because I was in residency, right? I was an ER doctor in residency and I would show up to a crisis. I would show up to a resuscitation and I had all this knowledge, all this knowledge I trained my whole life for, and I couldn't get it out of my head and into my hands into the patient. And not because I would necessarily freeze, but there would still be a little bit of a disconnect in there. I knew I wasn't playing up to the level I could play. And you go home from that. And it hits you like a ton of bricks because you realize this person mm -hmm. suffered because I couldn't bring the best of what I had to bear to offer them. My team couldn't get it together because I couldn't get out of my own head from it. This is a really humbling thought, right? You train your entire life to be in that moment. To, you've given everything you have to be an ER doctor to be in that moment, and you can't quite get it out of your head and into your hands. So that launched me on this whole thought of like, well, well what do you do about that, right? How do we do it? But can I, can I just interject there? Why, why was that happening before we get to the what? Why do you, th why was that happening? What was that dawning moment when you went back and realized, because before you go into the what and the solution, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we've got to understand the why. And I'm fascinated yeah. to understand why was that happening to you? Where was that blockage between brain and activity? So, um, there's a couple myths around that, right? One myth is that performing under pressure is a character trait that you either have or you don't. Right. I think that's a pretty common myth. Some people are just better at Definitely. this than others. And yeah. there's a idea that, you know, maybe I wasn't good at it, but I will tell you having, you know, delivered a non-zero number of babies, I have never seen a baby come out a fully formed ER doctor. Doesn't work, right? It's yeah. not a character trait. It's something you train. It's something you grow into and something you build, right? So that's probably Absolutely. not it. There's another myth that being able to perform under pressure is a side effect of time on target of seeing cases of doing things. And if that myth were true, it would always be the oldest person in the room that was best at this just because they've done enough. But that's not really right either, right? Time on target is necessary, but not sufficient to get better at performing Correct. in a crisis. So really it's a skill that you have to train. And I think that part of it at the beginning, part of the problem was I wasn't training it as its own skill. I was assuming that it would come up as I learned the rest of the stuff. So it, it, it's not just you who weren't, but I mean, that's, that's on medical schools, right? That's on how we teach emergency medicine. Exactly. And the more you push on that rabbit hole, the sort of deeper it goes, right? So the first set of questions mm -hmm. you ask in there that I asked was what's going on in, you know, inside my skull that I can change and make better at this, right? That's a very, very pretty classic way to do it, right? We have a problem. We assume it's partly us and we train ourselves to how to think better or, or buffer it or, or do sort of things. But the more I press on it and the more broadly we look at it and we can get into the different mission critical teams that we sort of do some of this work with, but the more broadly we look, you see, it's not just an internal human problem, right? It's a team problem and it's a systems problem. 
And it's all of those things. So to, to your question about, well, what is the problem? First off, I think it's that we're looking at it mostly as a thing that you can do yourself, as opposed to looking at the entire system. So Bryce, you recognized that you were in a crisis. You were in a moment that had high stakes, high uncertainty, time pressure, um, complexity, and liminality. And those are sort of the five pillars that I think about for an emergency, right? You recognized that, and that was good. But why didn't some system go off in the ship? Anytime the ship goes more than X degrees, right? Why wasn't there a system that helped everybody else get to the same conclusion that you'd gotten to? And that's not the answer to everything, but I think that's the answer to some of it. And we need to be studying both of those problems. How do you do it? And how does the system do it? But even with the system, because see, here, here's the thing that I was, you know, after, after we were back on, on dry land that evening that I was reflecting on was even with systems, you know, and, 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 you know, halfway through this, there's now, you know, crew members running around the deck and in, in, in a panic with wrenches and stuff in their hands. And the captain comes down and is screaming, you know, in Turkish and stuff like that. So people, people could tell that something was wrong, but <clears throat> the vast majority of people were still awaiting instructions, wondering what to do. Sure. And it made me reflect on something that, that we spent a lot of time studying in when I was at uh, the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, which, which is the air disaster at Tenerif in the 1970s, hmm. which is where a lot of our understanding of normalcy bias comes from. And it's one of the most studied, studied emergency situations or disaster situations hmm. in, in history because, because there were survivors, a few. And, and for those who don't know, we've talked about on the short show before, but this was until 9-11, this was the worst air catastrophe in the world. Two, two full, fully loaded 747s colliding on the runway at mm. Tenerife in the Canary Islands. And it's, it's, it's widely studied for a lot of reasons. One is it's, it's an example of sunk cost fallacy and all sorts of things like this that led to the disaster. But it's also a lot of time has been spent interviewing the, the, about, I think it was half a dozen people who survived the disaster out of several hundred. And what the survivors said is, that, and this is where I go to, when you, even when you have systems mm -hmm. in place, the survivors all did the same thing. They all did what they had been told in the pre-flight pre -pre briefing. They headed for the nearest exit. Mm -hmm. And... In the case of, of two of them that, 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 that have been widely studied, they didn't make it to the nearest exit because on their way to the nearest exit, the, they, the plane was gone and they fell onto the runway, but at least they were moving was the point. Sure. And the terrifying thing that they said was that as they ran up the rows towards what they thought was the nearest exit, everybody else on the plane was still alive. They were mm -hmm. in their seats with their seat belts on, looking left and right for someone to tell them what to do. And they had already mm -hmm. been told what to do in sure. the pre-flight briefing. But most people were sitting there w wondering what to do as the cabin filled with smoke. And, you know, within Paralysis. 120 seconds of them yeah. falling out of the plane, the entire fuselage was, was engulfed in a fireball. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the idea of normalcy bias is a really interesting one it sort of depends on what system you're working in and when, and how do you queue up for that, right? Yeah. So when I walk into the emergency department, I have a, you know, to, to borrow that story, I have a pre-flight ritual, for lack of a better word, that I use to change what's normal for me. And it's a series of cues that I go through about, okay, I'm now going into this space. This space operates under a different set of laws and regulations and universal things uh, than anything else does. And so I'm getting myself ready to do it. Right. And my team does the same thing. We do it in a couple of moments. Let, let's say as an easy example, we get a call in on the radio. Hey, there's a, you know, gunshot wound victim coming in ETA five minutes. They're going to go into this room. Their blood pressure is really low. Okay. So, you know, we're thinking through, we have that couple of minutes and we're using that minute to spin ourselves up into a different state of mind. Right. Right. And that's changing what normal is to some extent. And the actions that people are going to have when they've built these patterns that allow them to move from one frame of mind to another is what it's going to take to eliminate that normalcy bias. Cause it's just, it's not normal in that circumstance, but that opens up a ton of problems. How do you do that when you don't know what problem sets you're facing? How do you do that when say, you know yeah. some, but not all the problem sets and how much resources and energy do you spend on building those systems? Right? Cause there's always a trade-off for everything in the ER. That's my job. 
handle the patient in front of me, and reserve capacity to handle the bus crash that might come in 10 minutes. How do you do that? There's uh, there's a lot. I think one of the things that we do is build reflex packages, right? And a reflex package is the first three or four moves you're going to do in a situation while you're figuring out what situation you're in. They're the moves that are the 80% solution. They work most of the time and they allow you to, to borrow um, a phrase from uh, a Navy EOD expert. They allow you to use seconds to buy minutes, right? They I allow you that. to do those first things to create the space to have the smarter systems in your brain and everybody else's brain come online. Because it, even for me, a very highly trained ER doctor, you're not that smart in those first few seconds. Right, you're just relying on systems and instinct until the rest of the machinery kicks in. You know, have that little hamster has to like speed up the wheel enough, right, to get the to get the machinery yeah. going. But that can be very powerful. I mean, this is the whole. I mean, you you, you know, you talked about uh, the the uh, or I guess we I guess we talked about it before uh, we came on, yeah. which is which is uh, <laughs> uh, one of, one of our favorite pieces: uh, a failure to disagree by by. Daniel mm -hmm. Kahneman and Gary Klein, um, both of whom yeah. I had the, the privilege to work with when I was writing my book, Red Teaming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Gary, Gary believes that there's a lot of magic that happens in those moments. You know, as, as sure. the father of naturalistic decision making is, you know, it, it, it's a problematic term intuition, as, he, as mm -hmm. he's explained on the show. It's not intuition in, a, in an esoteric or metaphysical sense of, you know, having some sort of, you know, higher power whispering in your ear. It's, it's a automatic system one kicking in, in a virtuous way from distilling all of your experience from every other emergency you've had right. and, 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 and rapidly finding the pattern, rapidly fitting that as, as, as he and I talked about last time he was on the show, fitting that to a pattern that you've seen before, even if you're not conscious of it. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the way that usually plays out for us is, uh, sick, not sick, right? Is basically you can walk around a field of patients. You can walk around an ER and most experienced doctors who are experienced in emergencies will walk around that room and everybody will most of the time agree on who the sick patient is, even though it might not exactly be obvious from the outside, right? So that skill of identifying sick, not sick is a really important version of what you're describing is that is naturalistic decision-making, right? It's that idea of finding those hidden patterns that don't necessarily bubble to the surface. I can't exactly tell you why that person's sick, but if you made me, if you sounded an alarm and said a patient was going down, most of us would run to the room that's the sick person like that. To me, that gets into the obvious question of how in the world do you train that? How do you test that? How do you make sure that's working in the right way? How do you build teams that are operating with shared mental models of that, where when one person identifies a piece of information that has changed, where the universe has changed, how do they ripple that idea through the mental models of the rest of the team? How do you build a system that nudges people to do the right version of that? Right. So like, how do you not rely on one doctor looking at one patient being like, okay, yes or no? and harness the best of that at the same time. This is a team challenge, isn't it? And especially in, in your position, I guess the team's looking at you as the lead. It's like the old, the, it's like the old school pilot cockpit where the pilot in the cockpit was mm -hmm. God. And then we wondered why we had so many accidents because the engineer wouldn't speak up, the co-pilot wouldn't speak up. So I guess in what you're trying to achieve is enabling the whole team to bring its full capability because as you said earlier, you're, you're not the Superman. You're not the one who knows no. everything. So you have to unlock right. that across the whole, as we say, none of us is as smart as all of us. So it's that mm. it's not group think. It's how do you enable the group to think effectively and bring the wisdom of that expert team you have to bear on the situation that is rapidly evolving in front of you and you don't know what it is yet. And I guess, as you say, it's that seconds to minutes time gap that's buying you the ability to recognize what's going on and then affect your skills and of those of others in the right way. Hmm. Yeah. What I always say I am an imperfect human being. Medicine is an imperfect science and I am practicing medicine imperfectly. And if I start at that, if I start at those ideas and I start at the idea that still I will do my best, I will bring everything I have to bear to this patient mm -hmm. for them and their family and the community. You know, that gives us the, the structure, the humility, the everything to understand that, like you said, the team is smarter than any one person in the room, right? Part of my job is to get everybody in the room playing the same game and understanding that that's our best chance at keeping this person alive. I just wanted to jump in here. This, this is something that we hear a lot from, <laughs> I know where you're going. from, 
potential clients, or I mean, not, not from potential clients. This is here something we hear a lot in discussions with clients um, in the medical space, in the hospital space, and, and we've worked with several, is nurses will tell us, senior nurses will tell us that the biggest problem in our, in our hospital is that doctors don't listen to us, is that mm. we you know, sometimes have as much experience with the case as they do if we're older and, and, and we've seen this before many times. And if we try to speak up and say, but what about this? It's like, go stand over there and, you know, get out of my way. And that's something that we've talked with, with a couple of large medical organizations about. Yeah. How do you create teams that can listen to each other where every member right. of the team can be heard and it doesn't mean that they're they're right all the time or wrong, or the doctor's wrong all the time at all. It just means that they have different perspectives. They see different things. You know, there's a great study that we that we've talked about on the show that happened at, at at the Einstein Medical Center back east many years ago, where they had a MRSA outbreak, and the person who solved the MRSA outbreak, I mean, with with the help of of, of some some red teamers who were brought in to help facilitate the dialogue, were were the janitors. Because the janitors mm, were the ones right on. that, that figured out that there were more gloves in one wing where there was less MRSA than in any of the other parts. And they realized that the reason why there were more gloves was because the hospital was only buying medium gloves. Most of the nurses had small hands. The wing where the MRSA outbreak wasn't occurring, the head nurse had out of her own pocket every week stopped and bought a bunch of small gloves. And so she mm -hmm. had a much higher usage of gloves than they did in the other wings, even though when they interviewed them, when the hospital administrators interviewed all of the nursing staff and the medical staff, everybody insisted that they were wearing gloves all the time. But the janitors said, no, they're sure. not because we empty the trash. So that leads to my question. Is this a thing that is trained in the medical sector or is this something that Dan is concerned about, has been impacted by and is making this a part of your team engagement? because there's a distinct difference there so is this a norm or is this a specific under your realm yes to both right so thankfully if you look at if you look at the difference between medical education now and medical education when i was coming up through the system it's grown a lot right we have eliminated a lot of this doctor is god concept um sometimes voluntarily sometimes kicking and screaming as a community but we have eliminated a lot of it uh and we are more and more doing the the opposite of that, which is to create inclusive teams to harness the wisdom of the room and to get everybody working the same problem set. Um, I uh, was exposed to that really early in my training. I was very lucky where I was training, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Mass General and Brigham and Women's. Like these are super advanced places that really yeah. focus on teamwork, not just on individual skill sets. Um, but then also I had a, a bunch of experiences right when I was coming out of training, when I was like, you know, an attending standing on my own two feet for the first time, uh, where I was working in a lot of really small places. These are places where, where, you know, I might be the only doctor in the whole hospital for part of the day. Wow. And you realize like, okay, you are like, it is you and the nurses versus the world versus the universe. Right. And so you really have to understand it, it, it became very clear, very quickly that part of your job you know, was to take this idea of a rising tide lifts all ships and understand you have to train everybody around you to play at the top of their absolute game. And you have to learn from them and everything that they understand, right? How do we do it here? How do you do it? What have you seen that's a problem here? Like, I want to get better and I need your help to do it. And the more you get everybody asking that question, the more that virtuous you know cycle starts spinning and the more the team improves and, and moves forward. And could, like, strangely, that's almost easier to do in a really small shop than it is in a really big shop because the, oh, the ship yeah. itself is just, you know, able to turn, sorry to go back to the ship metaphor, Bryce, but it's able to turn at a much oh, you know, tighter radius. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's the thing is that, is that it, the, you know, the larger the organization, mm -hmm. large organizations need hierarchies to function and therefore they, they create rigid, more rigid hierarchies as a mm -hmm. result smaller organizations are tend to be less formal because they don't need to have that that level of formality but that opens up this virtual exchange of ideas and insights that that, that you lose at large organizations mm -hmm. and and that's true in medicine and it's true in every in in business and it's true in the military you know that's why you have special forces teams or the elite of the military is because everyone 
on, you know, on a Delta Force team where you have 12 operators, including the commanding officer, everyone on that team can speak up and say, mm-hmm. wait, let's not do this, you know, or wait, this is a better way of doing this. And you translate that into what soft guys call big army, um, mm-hmm. where you've now got a team of a thousand people. Um, and it's much harder for the, for, for the, the person, you know, the, the, the specialist to speak up and be heard in any way, shape or form. And so that's, that's it. That's, you know, you see that in the military, you see that in, in businesses, you know, what, one of the, one of the first large companies that hired us, uh, Verizon, the, the CEO brought, brought me in because he said, our problem is, is that we used to be really good at challenging ourselves when we were small and scrappy and clawing our way to the top of this wireless business when there was hundreds of different wireless carriers. And now that we're at the top of the, now that we've got the brass ring and we're at the top, we've like forgotten how to do that because we've had to become so polite with each other because we're so big and we've got to create all these, you know, and he says, I want to get back to having that ability to challenge ourselves when we don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's what we, that's what we worked on bringing in there. But my point is, is that I think that's true at any endeavor, the larger the organization, the harder it is to have those communications. So it's the more important in those situations to create systems that allow that to happen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, this is probably a really interesting time to bridge into the idea of intact teams versus swarm teams, right? Because I think the way to do these things, depending on the type of team set you're working in is really different. And sometimes that tracks big, small, but sometimes it's this intact swarm sort of difference in there. Um, so we think about an intact team and, and it's sort of like what you're describing about the 12 guys on a, on a Delta team, right? These are folks, or a, a better example is um, a professional sports team, right? These are folks that are selected to play on a team together. They train together, they work out together, they practice together. They also perform together at the highest arc of their ability. Then they go home and have barbecues at each other's houses and know each other and their families and everything, right? This is an intact team. There's all these webs of connection between stuff. And that creates this really rich environment where we have a different ability to speak up when we see something differently, right? So Bryce, you might be the team captain and I might be, you know, your second or third in command or something, but we know each other. And I trust that if I come up to you and say, Hey, look, man, this isn't really working the way I think it should. Could we try this instead? Right. We have that psychological safety that comes from knowing each other from these intact connections. The opposite of that is this thing that we call a lot of swarm team. This is something that we see in the hospital a lot. It's one of the one of the few, but not only places where we see it, but it's this incredible learning idea. So if I'm a patient in a hospital and I have a heart attack or I have a cardiac arrest or something, my heart stops, right? The nurse, whoever's nearby, hits that button on the wall, hits the code blue button, uh, sounds an emergency alarm. And then you get a bunch of people that assemble in that moment, right? There's this, you know, there's like the Batman signal and the Avengers assemble kind of moment. And there's dramatic music, not really, but it's the same idea, right? And you get this group that, that comes together. And so these are people that were doing some other job. A signal happens. They're pulled from that other environment. They assemble on a problem set. They self assemble as a unit. They try to solve the problem set. And then when the problem set is solved to one degree or another, they disappear back into their normal environments. Maybe without talking, maybe without learning, maybe without anything. Frequently, these are people that have never worked together before. Even worse in the hospital, often it's not even clear who they are. You might run into Mm -hmm. a room, everybody's dressed the same. You have no idea who the team leader is supposed to be. You don't know the skill sets of everybody, right? You you run into a room and you just have to self-assemble a team, figure out what the issue is, solve it, and then you go back to your normal work, right? So that's a swarm team. The advantage is that it's you can apply scarce resources where they're needed, where and when they're needed at a moment's notice. Incredibly able to pivot, right? You can assemble a team immediately in room 13A because that's where you need to be. And you can bring the entire resources of the hospital into that room all at once. But you have to figure out a way to have people do it and have to create these environments where they can speak up with each other, against each other. They can have this creative friction. They can have a marketplace of ideas where they argue back and forth about what the best idea is. But how do you do that when they've never even met or know who they are? Right? So that's a really different problem set. (laughs) I want to hear the answer to that question, but let's take a short break. and, And when we come back, tell us how you do that. That would be really great, Dan. Hey, folks, Bryce here. If you're listening to this and you're liking what you're hearing and you're wondering, am I a red team thinker? 
we have an easy way for you to find out. Just go to the show notes, click on the link there to our free assessment to find out if you are a red team thinker and what you can do to think more effectively, to lead more effectively, and to make better decisions faster in your complex world. Like I said, the link is in the show notes, or you can simply go to our website, redteamthinking.com. Check it out. I can't wait to see how you score. Welcome back. So right before the break, Dan, you were about to tell us about more about swarm teams. You told us what they were, mm -hmm. but how do you create well-functioning, high-performing swarm teams in these mission-critical environments? Love to hear you unpack that for us. Absolutely. And I will start with a request, which is that if you're listening to this and you know how to run swarm teams better than what I'm about to say, please tell me. I desperately need your advice on this. We all do. I don't think that there is a real perfect answer on how to run swarm teams. This is a really complicated, like forward problem that we're working on in the cutting edge of stuff, both in emergency departments in hospitals, but then throughout the mission critical teams universe, we see a lot of things that function like swarm teams do super interested in how to do them better. So if you have ideas like, like, please, I need them and I want them. Um, that said, right. So it's worth thinking for a second about why you would ever build a swarm team, right? Cause you might've been listening to what I said and be like, that's a ridiculous way to do things. Why don't you have a constant set of resources that do this? And why don't you do anything other than what Dan just said, which is probably like the hardest way to run a team. You throw everybody in a room. Nobody knows who everybody is. They have to self-assemble. They have to solve a problem. And then they disappear. Like it never happened again. Like that's the opposite of everything that we know about how good teams should be built and function, right? That's just like, nobody else does that. So why do we do that? Well, like one thing is that you actually can activate the entire set of resources in the hospital and devote it to a single point in time and space at a zero notice. That's pretty incredible, right? Yeah. Not many other systems have the ability to do that. Right? Can, can you imagine the entire government putting their entire resources at the point of one single spear? Like after somebody presses one button, like not really, like there I'm are really some things that to do like that. that. So yeah, I can imagine it's not. <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, there are some other models that work sort of like that, right? Like you can think about some of the stuff about, um, you know, I'm going to mispronounce it, but like the, the Kanban line, right. Where you pull it and everybody sort of swarms in. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And on cord. Thank you. Thank yeah. That's what it is. Uh, and jumps into it. Um, we also see this. So we see it when there has to be a fix that happens right away. We see it when you have to coordinate resources directly in a point in time and space. And we also see it when it occurs naturally after a disaster happens or something, right? So if, you know, a car That's goes off a bridge and about. goes in a river, yeah. Yeah. right? You get a swarm team from whoever's just around, right? And they have to self-assemble. And one of the recent podcasts I did was... Um, with a gentleman who is really big in the search and rescue community. And he was talking about how they go through the social dance of being like, well, do you know how to rescue people? Like, how do you, what do you say? How do you decide who the leader is? How do you decide how to follow? There's all that social intricacy that has to happen in like a second like that. Anyway, so there's some strengths and weaknesses to this approach, right? But the question is, how do you run it? If you're going to use one, how do you do it? Well, endlessly fascinating. A couple of things that we've come up with, right? First, you have to understand, again, it's about systems, not necessarily about people, right? So right. the idea of swarming happens before a swarm team happens. That's, that's not as obvious as that sounds, right? So if you're going to swarm effectively, you need to put processes in place ahead of time that allow that swarm to happen well. Right. Okay. That might be things like, in general, when a swarm happens, who should respond? And in general, who should be the first person to be in charge as a default, right? So in some hospitals that you work in, it's the ER doctor who leaves the emergency department, runs up somewhere in the hospital and, and essentially takes over the command of the room. But there's certain circumstances where they'll run up and actually not need to take over command. Very complicated. But as a default, what should happen in the, in the absence of anything else, right? Um, the second flip side of that is that swarms don't end when the swarm goes away, right? If you want to run a really effective swarm system, you have to have something on the back end that captures the learning from it. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, your hospital is no better tomorrow than it was today at running one of these swarm teams. And I think this is a huge problem. I am not seeing a lot of teams do this. I think it's an absolutely like empty field where we could be building so much architecture on top of it. After action reviews. 
after action reviews, each of these people go back to their own universe. They go back to whatever their own tasks are. They have other patients they need to get to, but they often never debrief as a group. And they never feed those lessons back into some internal group that's saying, well, how are swarm teams going in general? Right? It's hard enough at, at some of the places. This is the problem that, that you've, you've nailed it, Dan, is, is this, it's the lack of, of learning because this is how the learning happens. And, you know, one of the exactly. things that really struck me, one, one of my classmates was a Delta Force commander and he came and worked with us for a while after he got out of the military. And one of the things I learned from him is that one of the things that is the biggest key that Delta attributes internally to their own success is that after every mission, soon as you get back to base, you get an index card and you write your name on it and you put it on the table. And over the next few hours, everyone has to come and pick up everyone else's index card. And you only are allowed to give critical feedback. Mm. And here's the thing that they say is you are already on Delta Force. You are already on the most elite unit in the U.S. Army. You do not need to be told how great you are or what wonderful things you did. The only thing you need is to know how you could improve. And so everybody takes that card. And if you don't have anything to say, you can put a check mark or something just to show that you did it. And you have to say, here's, what, here's one thing that I, th- I thought mm-hmm. you could improve on. And then when everyone's done that as a group, they debrief that together. And it doesn't matter how successful the mission is or how screwed up it ends up. They have that discussion and they learn from it. And he, you know, the thing he explained to me, that is the secret of their success is that continuous learning and that continuous learning as a team. And you could, if you made the time and space for it as a hospital, have that happen. I would submit in, 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 in the swarm teams you're yeah. talking about. You know what? I'll take even a really, really simplified version of that, which is, do we even know where and when these swarm teams are happening? And have we at least figured out who's on them? <laughs> right? Like the right. bar is very low. So a hospital right? so hospital's not even capturing how many of these events are happening in a day and who, who came in, who went out. There's no mechanism formality wise. I'm sure they're capturing it somewhere. Right. There, there are people that, whose job it is to, um, to capture some of this data, but I would submit in most hospitals I've worked at, we don't get debrief reports from what's learned after every one of these. Right. And I've, I've, said, I've never seen that. Right. I, I will see sometimes it goes all the way to, you know, morbidity and mortality conference, which is one of the tools medicine uses to debrief. Right. And we can get into why that's a little bit weird in a second if you want, but, um, like sometimes it goes into that, but frequently, you know, multiple versions of this can go and maybe it's logged somewhere, but there, there's really no attempt to talk to the people about what happened, to talk to people about was the swarming effective. There's very rarely even attempts to be like, okay, did we have the right equipment available? Should we have called this a swarm to begin with? How do we even, how do we even break it down on a very simplified, like, you know, performance outcome matrix and be like, did we do okay? What was the outcome for the patient? Right. Really hard to get any of that, but you could imagine what the opposite of that would look like. Imagine if every time one of these things happened, there was somebody tasked to debrief it, like you're saying, to figure out if there's anything that could be done better, to learn from it and to push that information back out to the team over the next little bit of days, create databases of these events and really dig through them. And, And maybe there's somebody listening to this where their hospital does that. That's freaking amazing. Right. The amount of learning we could get out of this. This is what, what do football really teams not. do? I mean, I, you know, what, what, what do, what, what what do professional sports teams do? They, they sit a, as a team and watch the video over and over again after every game and look <laughs> at where the mistakes were, look at what was done right, look at what could be done more effectively. You could do that in a, in a hospital setting. Mm-hmm. Us can sit here and be like, we should do this, right? And I agree, we should do this. I love this. I love this idea. There is nothing that gets me more fascinated. Like I geek out about swarm teams, like nobody's business. I think this is literally one of the coolest things we've ever invented as a species and we should get way better at it, right? Just to put something wild out there like that. But so why aren't we doing it? So what do do football teams have that we don't in hospitals? Time. It it goes back to the, because of the other, because of the environment you're in, the other pressures, Mm -hmm. you're, you're swarming on an emergency. 
But <laughs> everything else, whatever you call it, the next level down, you're in a hospital. So you're dealing <laughs> with people who need those swarmers. They have to go back to what they were pulled away from and yeah. to be away from that individual for longer than they personally feel acceptable to. If they're sat in a crew room with you debriefing and taking notes, they're not doing their right. primary job. So I guess there's a psychological need to get back to it. And it's hard to bake that time in beyond the emergency because that's the only mm -hmm. requirement for a swarm. And this goes back to the question I had before the break was, as you were telling me about this intact versus swarm, my mind's going, oh, my God, this is just the craziest thing ever. How bad is this thing? And I said, do you have data on the performance of swarm teams? Clearly, you must do. But given what we've just talked about, probably not. So how, how effective is a swarm concept? Do we, do we even know that? The outcome of the mm -hmm. patient who you're swarming around, mm -hmm. is the data there to show how or not the swarm team performed and how we could improve it? But, but Marcus, you nailed it with the time thing. That, is that the right answer, Dan? I, I'd love to hear your, your – is that the reason the that you were getting that's at? that's part of it. Yeah, so that's part of it, right? So, so Marcus, we have data on the survival rate of in-hospital cardiac arrests. Um, which is one of the main reasons that swarm teams would be called. Um, on the OB floors, we have data on crash C-sections or shoulder dystocias or things that are like really life-threatening and unexpected emergencies like that where things need to come together. We have data on first-pass success rate of unexpected airway issues. So we have some pieces of data and they're generally pretty good. We don't really, in most cases, capture the data to answer some of the deeper questions about how did the team and how did the swarm system perform? which is a really subtly but importantly different set of information mm -hmm. than what is the okay. outcome from the patient, right? And if you, if you go back to like uh, Annie Duke in her book, Thinking in Bets, I think explains this really well, the difference between performance and outcome, right? Performance yeah. is how we did, outcome is what happened. Yeah. So we capture outcome data. We really don't capture a lot of performance data, which is really, Bryce, what you're saying that a lot of the, the folks in Delta do when they're describing- and, Or a and professional through. football team. Sure. So is it time though? Is it, is, is it simply what, you know, this issue that, People, there's not time made and everybody is too busy anyways because hospitals, let's be honest, are in, at least in the U.S., are so understaffed in, in many areas that people people mm -hmm. don't have – there's no way to give them the time. The other thing you said I mean, that what, 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 do sport, what does the sport team have is, is a coach. It has mm -hmm. one person whose job it is to make sure that everyone sits and watches that video. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's a couple things in there. So time, right? Like there are definitely circumstances, you know, and I'm thinking of, geez, this really, really terrible day a little ways back where we had a, um, a young child come in in cardiac arrest and we weren't able to bring the child back. And right as we were, you know, slowing the room down and pronouncing the the young child dead and allowing their parents the space to grieve. You know, the nurse comes up behind me, puts her hand on my shoulder and goes, Dan, there's another kid coming in with a gunshot wound to the chest. We need your entire team to spin up again immediately. Wow. And you're like, okay, there is no time to process. There's no time to debrief. There's not even time to say goodbye to this child or their family. We're needed in room three right now. This family needs us just as much as that one did. Right. And there are times when that's the reality. And I know there's a lot of folks listening to this from, you know, the military world. And I know there are times like that in the military too, right? Where there is not the time and space to debrief and process because the next mission is here right now. And, you know, your country and your teammates rely on you to spin up again immediately. Now that said, that is the exception rather than the rule. And I think one issue is that we tend to think we are really busy and we tend to think we don't have time because we feel time pressure. But there's a difference between feeling time pressure and somebody telling you there's a kid that shot in room three. So I would encourage you, if you're listening to this, to, to ask yourself, like, which of these camps am, is this moment actually in? It's, it's one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves is I don't have time to learn. I don't, it's a, I don't have time to learn. I don't have time to train. I don't have time to, to get to talk to my people. But that's that's the job of leadership is making that time. It is, is making time after. If it's not on shift, before you all go off shift, and one of the things we used to do in the military, okay, we're all going down the pub. Right, we've had a hell of a day. We haven't got time to, nobody had time to stop, nobody ate. Nobody went to the sure. bathroom. 
we did a 12 hour shift of mental crazy, just mm-hmm. a whirlwind. And then when it finishes, the leader steps up or someone steps up, Hey guys, let's all go down the bar and we'll go down yeah. the bar, de-stress, talk about what went, what happened, what went wrong, what we did well. So if you don't have the time to do it in your cycle, mm-hmm. making that, there's always time. Right. Yeah, but you can't, Marcus, you like, so that's excuses, a very British thing. You, how you do it. You can't ask a, a pub, a, a canteen, go no, but I mean, you can't ask, you can't ask a bunch of nurses and doctors who need to get home to their kids and stuff to go and spend an hour no, afterwards. Not to, immediately. You know, is there right. a monthly catch up? Is there a swarm teaming? You know, there's got to be right. some time, some way, is what I'm saying. So there, there yeah. could be. Right. Yeah. There could be. So one of the issues though, is that you, you reach, you, you're getting into combinatorial mathematics here, right? So Marcus, I don't know how many people were on your team, but they're probably the same people that were on your team next week and the week before, mm-hmm. before that, right? For us, when I think about who's in that room, right? If you do the math on that, I, I back up the envelope to this, you know, the other day, you know, you have, let's say there's 50 versions of me, there's 20 versions of the doctor, in each level below me, and there's four doctor levels below me, there's an unknown number of nurses. I can't even actually find a full manifest of all of the nurses, although I've looked. I don't know how many RTs or pharmacists there are. When you run that math, that gets into millions, like high numbers, hundreds of millions of combinations. So how do you ask all these people that, that, you know, also maybe this is the first time they've ever been on a swarm team. (laughs) <laughs> right? Maybe they've never building, been yeah. to a cardiac arrest before and they're dealing wow. with the, oh my God, I just watched somebody die. Right? That's a different problem set that you need to work on than the person who's been in and out of crisis over and over again, experiences this like me as part of their life and is trying to work on a systems issue of improving, you know, the throughput of something. Those people so, need wildly different things. Well, here, here so I'm going to give somebody, I think, a great business idea here. <laughs> I, here's how you could do it, which is with software. If, if you mm-hmm. have, you know, if, if, if everybody yeah. in the hospital has an RFI ID chip in their badge, and so the hospital, the hospital is aware, you know, the hospital, I don't mean the administrators, I mean the hospital, the technology can be aware of where sure. people are at. And you geofence each, each area and you, and you track codes. So if there were three codes mm-hmm. on this shift, Everyone who was in the room that coded during the codes, the system yep. knows they were in there and, and they get sent, they get pushed a notification to say, if anything happened and they make it anonymous, if anything exactly. happened yeah. on that code you were on, type in here, what was, what, what was the mistake that you saw yeah. and type in here, what was the great thing you saw? And if they don't do it, they don't do it. But at least Ultimate you have feedback. created an opportunity to capture that. Mm-hmm. I would say somebody, you know, could probably make a lot of money developing that system and rolling it out to hospitals. And I'd add a layer onto that, which is that would be a wonderful way for us to check in with our teammates and make sure they're okay. Yes, you could add a psychology assessment to that too. That's my other question. I was going to ask about the psychology behind this for people. For yeah. sure. Like, like, listen, I, I don't know if either of you all have ever done CPR, but if you do CPR, the first time you do CPR, you feel the person's ribs break under your hands. And that is a hard moment. And you go home and you have nightmares. I had nightmares. Almost everybody that I talked to that does this has had nightmares the first time they did CPR. But nobody told me that. So I woke yeah. up the next day being like, oh my God, I'm a terrible doctor. What's wrong with me? I can't hack it. Right. And only years later do you start talking about this and you're like, oh my God, that's just like a normal thing. Like, why didn't anybody tell me this? Yeah. Right. So, so if we could do this where we could capture the people and be like, hey, like, here's some things that might happen to you in the next couple of days. Like, don't worry about this, but worry about this. <laughs> right. Like, do you want to talk to somebody? Can we debrief? Like, that's a, that's a recipe to working on resilience, to decreasing burnout, to improving capture of information, to making the hospital better today, tomorrow than it was today. And to most importantly, and this is like, like when I think about what one of my highest virtues that I want out of my life is, that is a recipe to never waste suffering. Right? I love that. That is one of our biggest jobs because I can't promise I can save the patient. I can't promise I can relieve their pain, but I have to promise to them that I will never waste their suffering. And that's my problem with this is that we're wasting suffering when we're doing it. Yeah. Here's an idea of how you could do this. 
and it's something that the, that the U.S. Army has done very effectively. And you may be familiar with it already. It's called a fishbowl exercise. And the way that a fishbowl exercise works is you you get a group of people. So you could you could take, for instance, you know, it could be a team of doctors, ER doctors. It could be a an ER doctor, an ER nurse, an RT, you know, and and whatever. And you put them in the center of a room around a table. You give them, you know, drinks and, and chips and, and, you know, snacks. And it's just like, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's just like kind of like a pub setting, like Marcus was talking about, but around the room, you have younger people, new people who are going to be in the role that those people are in. And you just give them an hour to yeah. talk. And if they get stuck, you have, you ask questions like, what's the toughest thing that you, that has ever happened to you? What's, what's, what, what do you mm -hmm. wish somebody had told you when you went in? And, you know, the U S army was doing this really, um, effectively with officers who were being deployed for the first time to Iraq and Afghanistan. And what they would do yeah. was they would have officers who had just come back. Like they, you know, literally right. like flown back yesterday and they'd mm -hmm. put them in the room and they'd give them, they give them, you know, uh, you know, some soft drinks and, and some, some pretzels and they'd sit there and, and they'd have in, in a circle in like a, you know, kind of like a, a lecture hall around them. 50 officers who are going to be deployed in the next, in the next, you know, week to, to, to whichever place they were going. And they just kick it off by saying, you know, how, what, you know, not, you know, just tell us your war stories, but like, what was, you know, now you've been back, what do you wish somebody told you before you went? You know, yeah. what was the, what was the most painful lesson you had to learn? You know, and then people are hearing this and it's, it's much more meaningful for the people who are listening than, than watching a movie or, or reading a book or Absolutely. hearing a lecture. But this is what's, but you're getting to what you're talking about, Dan. You're capturing the hard won lessons, the painfully yeah. rested right. out of the, the hands of, of horrible situation learnings that otherwise just get left, that just, just dissipate and nobody captures that. Yeah. And you create this institutional learning that becoming a learning organization that's like an organism that's, that's learning from its mistakes. And you could do the same thing in a hospital. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. Before we wrap up, Dan, I want to talk about the emergency mind. Yeah. Who's that for? What's the message and why did you write it? I've got a sense mm -hmm. I know why, given our conversation today, but I'd be really interested yeah. to understand who, <laughs> who's it focused at. Um, so I, I wrote it basically, you know, Bryce, as you're saying, as a fishbowl. Right. I, I wrote it because these were lessons that I had learned that I wished somebody had taught me when I was coming up. And there wasn't a book like that when I was coming up. I kept looking for it. I was actually kind of amazed there wasn't a book like that coming up. And at some point I was like, all right, I guess I have to write it then. And, you know, sort of turned it over. <laughs> um, but it, um, you know, I, I wasn't going to do any of it. And uh, it was actually this idea of never wasting suffering. And it was this, this case when I was working in Haiti of these two infants that, um, that died. And, uh, it was years. I, I wouldn't talk about it. I wouldn't talk about it with anybody. And finally I ended up telling, you know, a couple close friends of mine about it. And, and one of them who is an expert storyteller really challenged me and said, look, if you never talk about this, then these kids died basically for nothing. But if you're able to share some of the lessons, maybe some good can come out of it, even though it hurts to say it, even though it hurts to look in that space again. And I, you know, I, I sat with that for a while and eventually I was like, you know, yeah, actually I, I don't want to waste that suffering. I really want to have folks learn from this and be better than I was, than I am, and to be better tomorrow than we are today. And so that, that was sort of the, the nidus from it. Um, and it came together in all honesty during COVID when I, like many ER doctors, assumed that I would die. I just sort of figured this would, you know, at the beginning, like we didn't really know what we were facing and I sort of assumed this would be it. And so I took a bunch of shifts from my teammates who were pregnant or had kids. And I was like, all right, you guys go home. Like, this is me now. Um, and I, in order to get through that, I would, I would every day do a couple of things. And one of those things was, would try to build something that would outlive myself. Uh, and over a little bit that became writing that book. Wow. Um, and, you know, Thankfully, I did not die, and I'm now here talking about it, which is totally wonderful. Uh, and now we get to sort of like you know leverage that into all of these really cool things. But it's so so in part, it's for 
junior ER doctors for sure. That's kind of the obvious answer. But but really, it's for anybody that has to learn to apply knowledge under pressure, right? And that is facing the real consequences of that. Where if you do not apply knowledge under pressure the right way, there are things that go that go bad, right? And that could be for you, that could be for your teammates, that could be for your your clients or your patients or anything else. So we use stories from the emergency department to illustrate it, but you don't really have to understand any medicine to read it. And in fact, it's really designed for everybody else that has to do these kind of tasks. Um, we see it used in fire departments. We see it used in military areas. Uh, we see it used in a lot of the startup world for people that are interested in, you know, figuring out how to get their, their young companies over the hump of something. Um, but I wrote it because I had to. That's an amazing contribution, Dan. And like you said, that's kind of like a fishbowl right there, you know, and that's, we need to just figure out ways to do this more. Uh, an organization that doesn't learn is an organization that makes the same mistakes over and over again. And Absolutely. then, as you say, if those lessons are, are learned at the expense of human suffering or life, those are costly lessons to be just wasted. You've given right. us a lot to think about, Dan. I feel like we've just scratched the surface, though. I think we need to have you back on the show and talk oh, about this. Oh. And we should, and, and My we pleasure. should have Gareth yeah. from, from the human factor on, too. At the same time, that would be an awesome conversation. Thank you for sharing, Dan. Uh, thank you all for having me. I, I, I hope this inspired some folks to think about this stuff. And if anybody wants to build that RFID kind of business, <laughs> reach out to me. I think that's actually super cool. But most importantly, like I, I, hope, I hope you all too. walk away from this. I, and, I want to be there. The, yeah, man. Oh, let's do it together. <laughs> Yes. That'd be great. Awesome. <laughs> That'd be great. You know, I think that's super interesting. But that idea of never wasting suffering, I hope you I hope you walk away from from this with that and think about that in your own life. <laughs>